The first historical item that I ever knit were a pair of slippers from 1885, and I made those over a year and a half ago now. And while it did start this whole historical knitting passion for me, I will say that I can never really wear them because they're far too delicate. I didn't construct them with the proper soles, and they're far too loose, so while they are pretty and I very much enjoyed the process of making them, they aren't ever actually wearable. If you've been following me for a little bit, then you'll know that a few months ago I tried making another pair of slippers, but this time from the 1920s, and I learned for my first time because I actually used a pair of wool felt soles in order to make the soles more sturdy and hold up better to wear, and that worked fine, except they're so slippery, and even though I tried a little bit later to make them less slippery, I still don't really wear them just because they are a little bit too dangerous for me to wear around the house. Now that I'm making loungewear for the 1890s, something casual to wear around the home, I also wanted to have a pair of slippers, especially now that it's getting a little bit colder. I also wanted a pair of slippers to wear when I'm wearing my stockings, just because hand-knit stockings take a long time to make and I want to protect them from wearing them out on the floor. So I'm gonna go back to my 1892 copy of The Art of Knitting. There's a few options in there, but I chose this pair of bedroom slippers because just reading through the pattern, I don't really understand the construction so I kind of want to figure out exactly how these slippers are made just by trying to make it up myself. And hopefully the third time is a charm to make a pair of sturdy, wearable slippers from the 1890s this time that I won't slip and slide all over the apartment in. For the slippers, I'm going to be using Knit Picks and Dian Treasure yarn in dark gray and this contrasting white color. This is actually the yarn that I have left over from the sweater that I knit in the introduction, and it is super soft because it's 100% baby alpaca. I want the main color to be the dark gray and the contrasting color to be that light white. These slippers are constructed as one long strip that is then somehow wrapped around the foot. I guess I'll figure that out a little bit later, but the main pattern of the slipper is a waffle stitch or a honeycomb stitch. The original pattern calls for six squares, so that's what I'm going to try out to see if it's the right size for my foot. Waffle stitch or honeycomb stitch is almost like a slip stitch colorwork pattern, so it's not only two colors, but it also has a bit of a 3D texture, which I really like. I'm also holding it up to my foot just to see if it's the right dimensions, and honestly, it looks a little bit tall if I wrap it all the way around my foot like this, especially in comparison to the original picture. So I am unfortunately going to unwind all of this work, and I'm going to make it half as tall, three squares. Coming from the future, I will tell you that maybe four squares squares would have been the right size for my feet rather than three. So if you decide to remake this, maybe do it a little bit taller on your feet than I did on mine. After deciding on the appropriate width for my strip of my slippers, it was then time to just knit that same slip stitch colorwork pattern for both of the slippers. As I mentioned before, what's really important to me is that these slippers are really durable, so I have a pair of wool felt soles that I'm going to be sewing the strips that I knit onto. Now that I have the strips done and my soles are ready to have the strips sewn onto them, this is the part that I found quite confusing. I tried to read through the instructions multiple times and I'll leave a link down to them below, it's a free resource, because I was really confused. I figured out the first fold, which is supposed to be folding down one corner to the other and then you have a bias strip. But what was quite confusing to me is exactly how the other end then attached. It said it isn't attached end to end and it's not really attached to the bias fold. So I just tried attaching it to where I thought it was supposed to go at first. Although very obviously after I attached it this way, that was not the way that these slippers were meant to be constructed at all. 
I then took a look back at the original picture in the pattern, which is why I always like to knit up patterns that have pictures because it helps understand the construction a little bit better when the instructions aren't as clear as I'd like them to be. And I think I finally figured it out. So you fold it down in order to create that bias strip and then you actually bring the other end around and you attach it to that piece that's going vertically or horizontally I guess across your strip and then your toes actually go into that little cone that's formed at the tip of the slipper. So these slippers are far pointier than I was expecting them to be and also quite a bit pointier than what my soles are. Being again from the future and looking back, I would definitely have reshaped these soles before sewing these strips onto them. The soles in typical Victorian slippers are much skinnier, especially at the tip. I actually found a pair of original 1850s slash 1860s slippers with a very good picture of the insoles only after I had sewed everything together, which showed to me that the tips of the slippers are typically much narrower than the soles that I have. So if I were to do it again, I would definitely make them much thinner at the tip than what they are because it kind of bows and curves in a strange way when they're much more rounded than what the knitted strip is wanting the sole to be. Nevertheless, I decided to sew the strip onto the sole. I did originally think that the soles were more gray in color, which is why I went with a gray yarn, but I think they're not too far apart. It's kind of a grayish brown, so it doesn't clash too horribly, and I used a piece of very thin thread and a needle to actually sew this in place. I also decided to make this strip a little bit shorter than the full circumference of the soles because I didn't want them to be so loose. The problem I had with my other slippers is that they're far too loose for me to wear them as well, so I wanted to have some tension in these slipper sides to make sure that they don't fall off my feet when I wear them. Now that I've sewn the size of the slipper to the sole and I verify that it actually fits my feet, which I'm super excited about even though the soles curl up a little bit because like I said, they're far more rounded than the pointed tip of what the knitted side is meant for. I'm still really excited. I think that they look really, really cute. I love that little waffle stitch or honeycomb pattern and they don't really fall off my feet, especially while I'm wearing socks. But the last piece that I'm gonna add to these slippers is that little ruffled trim at the top, which is another opportunity to make Make them a little bit tighter around my feet just to make sure that they're secure while I'm wearing them. Now the ruffle trim at the top did take me quite a while to figure out first of all how wide to make it because it just says as wide as you'd like and I ended up making it four stitches wide which doesn't seem very wide but the ruffle trim is very poofy so that was plenty actually for my slippers to make a four stitch wide ruffle trim. The instructions are also not particularly clear especially because they're written for a needle slash knitting style that's described in the book which I don't think is a continental style of knitting which is the way that I knit so I had to improvise a little bit with the way that I wrapped the yarn around my fingers in order to to create those two extra loops with every stitch that I'm knitting. So for every stitch that I create, I'm actually creating two fluffy loops to create that extra puffy trim on the top of my slipper. Once again, I decided to make that trim at the top slightly smaller than the circumference of what the strip at the top of the slipper was, just to create a little bit extra tension at the top of the foot to make sure that when I'm barefoot and wearing these slippers, they have a less likelihood of actually falling off. In my previous attempt at slippers, I would have now called them completely finished, but I didn't want to slip and slide over the entire apartment in these. So I actually purchased this anti-skid fabric and I've decided to attach them to the bottom of my slippers. Looking back, I would maybe make it in one piece rather than two separate pieces, just because when I'm walking around and picking up my feet, you can see it from the underside. So I would have made it look a little bit more uniform, but I will say they're very good at stopping me from slipping around. So I just just use needle and thread to sew twice around the edges just to keep them nice and secure to the bottom of my soles.
After finishing the first slipper, I repeated this entire process one more time in order to get a matching right slipper. And I will say they're so comfortable to put on. They're very secure and they stay on very well and I am not slip sliding around my apartment. The second slipper that I made does look better than the first. The first has slightly strange look as I was trying to sew the pointed toe to the rounded sole, but I think that they still look really nice, especially in comparison to the original pattern. The original pattern does call for a ribbon bow. I don't have any ribbon handy right now, but please let me know. What do you think? Should I add the bow to these slippers at the front? Do you think that'll be a nice finishing touch or do they look okay without the bow? And that is it. My first pair of historical slippers that are actually functional and safe for me to wear every day. I can't wait to wear these as I'm making the rest of my 1890s lounge outfit. Thank you so much for watching and if you liked what you saw please feel free to give me a thumbs up on this video and if you want to follow me as I make all the rest of the pieces for my 1890s lounging at home outfit then feel free to subscribe and I hope that I'll see you again really soon.